Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, Going Digital, Copyright and Licensing with Elliot Bledsoe. My name is Kevin, and I look forward to hosting today's Creative Connections webinar. I would like to start by firstly acknowledging the traditional owners of countries throughout Australia, including where you are today. I myself come to you from the lands of the Gamaraigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, I pay my deep respect to the elders past, present and future. If you would like, please um, share an acknowledgement of the country that you are on in our chat area, um, which you can find at the bottom of your screen. So currently on screen, there is a blue PowerPoint holding slide with some text and some videos on the side with our guest speakers and also our Auslan interpreter, David. I am a man in my early 40s um, with fair skin, brown eyes and dark hair. And today I wear a blue shirt in front of a black backdrop. Um, welcome to today's um, webinar, everyone. These sessions have been designed and produced for you, and we hope they provide support, resources, and a sense of collective reimagining of our futures and practices during this changing times. I'm so encouraged that so many of you are taking this time to learn and to share and to explore. And we invite you to continue to, to join us throughout the coming months um, as we continue to deliver these webinars for you. Before I hand over to Elliot, um, uh, just a quick recap on some of our housekeeping and features for today's session. Firstly, live caption is available, and if it's not activated, you can do so by clicking on the closed caption or the CC feature in Zoom. Uh, and you can find that at the bottom of your screen or on the top if you're using a mobile device. Um, today's session will be recorded, and we will send that out to everyone that's registered next week. Um, as Elliot will most probably highlight uh, that today's session being of a legal nature, um, we won't be able to provide any specific advice on specific cases because of course we are not lawyers, um, but we hope that you will learn some of the general legal concepts or concepts that um, we explore today. And also that you will know where to go and find more information. If you need any additional support, please get in touch. Our email address is leadershipprogram at australiacouncil.gov.au. We'll be hosting a Q&A at the end, so make sure you pop your questions in the Q&A section, which you can find, again, in the player feature of Zoom. So, okay, it is a great pleasure to introduce you to our guests today. Um, um, currently on screen is a PowerPoint slide with some text to introduce our guest speaker. Um, there is an image of a man with sunglasses wearing a blue t-shirt um, shot in an outdoor nature setting. Building on from our copyright session that we had last week with Arts Law, we are today joined by Elliot Bledsoe from the Australian Digital Alliance to further explore this topic in, in a bit more detail and from a, um, a, a range of different angles. As many of us are uploading content, streaming content and exploring how digital specifically can become part of our sustained um, operations and practices, it's critical that we sharpen our knowledge um, in these areas. Um, sometimes, and seemingly, this seems to be a complex area to understand, but I know Elliot uh, will do a great job in trying to make it a little bit simpler for us to e explore. So Elliot has made his career helping artists and arts organizations publish, play, post, tweet, and trend. Um, Elliot wear many hats. Uh, he runs a communications micro consultancy called Agentry. He's actively involved um, with arts fronts and, the, um, and feral arts. And he's also the copyright officer at the Australian Digital Alliance and sits on the Australian Libraries Copyright Committee to just name a, a few. Um, Elliot, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your thoughts and ideas. Um, I'll hand over to you now, and I believe that you are going to share some slides with us. So we'll flick over to yours. Thanks, Elliot. Yes, thank you, Kevin. 
I'll just share my screen. Just give me one moment. While I get things set up. Uh, okay, I'll share this slide set with everyone. You're able to see those slides? Yep, that looks good. Yep. Great, perfect. Alrighty. Uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Uh, I'm Elliot Bledsoe, uh, and I'm the Copyright Officer at the Australian Digital Alliance, as Kevin's already indicated. Um, I'm a fair-skinned man in my mid-30s uh, wearing a modelled t-shirt with the Back to the Future logo on it and a picture of the DeLorean from the movie uh, and I'm surrounded by my bookcase and other popular culture references. Um, a little bit about the ADA, the Australian Digital Alliance. We're a broad coalition of copyright users and innovators advocating for the public interest in copyright. Um, today I'll be discussing copyright and licensing in particular when considering doing activities online. Uh, the important thing here is that uh, the nature of online means that copyright or automatically comes into play because the use of online is what's considered a communication under the Copyright Act. And so basically anything involving the online environment uh, involves copyright in some way. Um, I'll also add that while there'll be a lot of images and text on my slide set, uh, I won't be audio describing every slide, but I will be speaking to the content on the slide set. Uh, and certainly I'm, I'm aware that those of you who do have access requirements have been issued a copy of the slides in advance. Uh, if you need it in any other format, uh, I'm more than happy to provide it uh, in whatever format you require. Alrighty, so welcome to today's webinar for the Australia Council for the Arts. I'd like to thank Kevin and the team for the invitation to present as part of this webinar series. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our Auslan interpreters for their work today. I'll try to speak uh, as slowly as I can. Uh, before we begin, I also would like to acknowledge the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people as Australia's first peoples and traditional custodians of the land. I've noticed that a number of people have shared uh, their own personal acknowledgements in the chat, which is very great to see and great to see such a wide spread of attendees and the different First Nations countries that they come from. Uh, I and the ADA pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people with us today and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people, their communities and their cultures throughout Australia. People often ask me why acknowledgement to country is important from a copyright perspective. And to that, I usually say to people, copyright's a legal protection designed to encourage the sharing of knowledge, ideas, and culture. It's, an, it's important to recognize and respect that indigenous, pe indigenous people the world over have been sharing knowledge through networks for hundreds of thousands of years. Australia has a long and rich history of storytelling, starting with our first peoples. So, with today's session, feel free to take your own notes if you wish, but of course the session is being recorded and the recording of the session and the slides will be made available after today's training. Plus there's a lot of other resources available, which I'll list at the end of the session. Uh, also, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to add them into the chat or using the Q&A tool. Uh, usually I'd take questions during a session, but that's a little bit difficult in the webinar format. There will be some time at the end for questions, but also maybe, hopefully, Kevin might uh, pull out some of the more pertinent questions related to topics that we're talking about and jump in with those as we go. Uh, but certainly, if, uh, if you've got questions, you can uh, put them in the chat or Q&A and we'll either look at them during the session or at the end in the Q&A. Now, also, you can reuse this presentation any way you like because it is available for reuse under the terms of a Creative Commons Attribution 4.0 international license. Uh, what that means is that you're basically free to copy and redistribute it or any modified version of it that you create, as long as you acknowledge the Australian Digital Alliance as the copyright owner. All right, let's get started. So when you're thinking about copyright and the materials that are protected by copyright, 
uh, it's important to understand that there are kind of three main aspects about copyright that come into play. In particular, it's important to understand what material is protected by cop copyright, what uses are restricted by it, and how long copyright protection lasts for. Now, I know that Susan Derry from Arts Law gave an overview of copyright, so I won't focus too heavily on the fundamentals, but I will look at a quick recap to inform today's training, and also because the nature of licensing means that you need to have an understanding of some of the fundamentals of copyright to understand how a copyright license interacts with those elements of the copyright system. So in particular, copyright protects a lot of creative content. Uh, basically, uh, pretty much anything you can think of is likely to be protected by the copyright system. This includes things such as uh, writing, you know, books, novels, uh, screenplays, etc., theatre, dance, music, uh, visual arts, engravings, photographs, sound recordings, films. The, the kind of breadth of what is covered by copyright is quite extensive and falls under either what's referred to as the works categories or subject matter other than works. Now, depending on the type of material that you're talking about, copyright affords the copyright owner different exclusive rights. Um, so for the duration of copyright, the owner can prevent unauthorized use of the material uh, or choose to assign or license the copyright to other parties. So this includes common things such as the ability to reproduce or copy the material, um, as I mentioned earlier, communicate, which is uh, the electronic transmission of copyright material, uh, to publish it for the first time, to perform it or adapt it in some cases. Uh, and so depending on the type of material, uh, the copyright owner attracts certain rights um, that give them the exclusive control of those uses. The other piece of the puzzle is to understand the duration. So again, depending on the type of material in question, the duration at which copyright exists uh, is different depending on the type of material. So if you're talking about works categories, literary, dramatic, musical and artistic works, they're protected for the life of the creator plus 70 years. Um, so the copyright carries on and exists after the death of the original author. Um, in relation to things such as sound recordings and films, the copyright duration depends on whether or not the material has been made public or not. Uh, so where it's been made public, it's the year that it was made public plus 70 years. Uh, and if it's never been made public, it's the year it was created plus 70 years. Now, basically, the general rule goes that if material is still protected by copyright, then unauthorised use of the material in a way that relies on the rights of the copyright owner is an infringement. While it's worth flagging that there are exceptions to the copyright in the Copyright Act um, that allow people to make certain types of uses in prescribed situations, uh, generally speaking, uh, you know, they cover a wide range of types of uses, but they can be quite difficult to apply um, and there's often not a huge body of case law to support them. Uh, but it is definitely worth noting that copyright exceptions do exist, uh, but I'm not going to look at them in detail today. Rather, the purpose of today's webinar is to provide more information about copyright licensing. Um, and I guess that's because realistically, for most contemporary material, most copyright material that's still protected by copyright, copyright licensing is the most common mechanism through which uh, another party is granted rights to use that material. Um, in short, you can do anything you have permission to do, and the most common form, as I said, is a copyright license. Um, if you have a license to use the material from the copyright owner, and you use, your use is within the scope of that license, then you have an infringed copyright. So the good thing about licenses is that you don't have to know the law per se, rather you just have to follow the terms specified in the license. The license becomes a kind of signposting of what you can and can't do with the material. And as long as you follow the conditions and terms set out in the license, then you should be okay. A few things worth noting about assignments and licensing. So an assignment is a transfer of copyright from one party to another. So if you're asked to assign your copyright in a contract or some kind of legal document, you are giving up ownership of that material for the benefit of somebody else. Uh, for an assignment to be valid, it must be in writing and signed by the assignor. Um, a license is a contract between two or more parties which grants permission to reuse material on specified terms. 
Uh, a license doesn't have to be in writing, but it's obviously easier to evidence. Uh, common terms uh, related to it, sorry, um, common terms related to licenses often relate to things such as uh, how long the license lasts for, where the license applies, and whether or not the rights are granted on an exclusive or non-exclusive basis. <clears throat> I'll talk a little bit more about what those terms mean uh, later on. In many instances, you get a license directly from the copyright owner. Uh, lots of times for the kinds of situations that many of you as the audience are dealing with, this is probably going to be the original creator of the work. Um, you know, the person who originally created the material is likely to still be the copyright owner and would be the party in a position to grant a license, uh, you know, to you to make use of the material. But it's also quite common for a third party to now be the copyright owner. So this might be a situation where uh, a publisher, uh, you know, a book publisher has published the material on behalf of an author or a record label. Uh, has published music on behalf of a, a band or a solo musician, or a news organisation or magazine has published material written by uh, an author or a writer or a journalist. Um, in those situations, uh, there could be another party who is now the copyright owner. Uh, it's quite common in those kinds of relationships for those types of organisations to take either an assignment or a licence to the material uh, and as such may be the copyright owner and would be the party that would need to issue a permission. Um, some commercial bodies, particularly bigger commercial players like news organisations, have gone through the process of setting up uh, licensing systems on their websites, which generate standardised contracts and uh, have prescribed fees for the types of use of their content. These kinds of systems basically are kind of a one-stop shop where you specify what you're wanting to use, the types of uses that you're wanting to make of it, and it essentially rolls you out a standardised contract and specifies a fee. As long as you've paid the fee, you get the licence and you can use the material based on what the licence provides to you. There are also a number of open content licensing schemes uh, that grant public licences to reuse material on specified terms. Now, this might be something like requiring attribution or to be acknowledged as the creator of the work, uh, or it might be only permitting non-commercial uses of the material, for example. Any uses outside the scope of the public license, you would need to go back to the copyright owner and request a specific permission. So, for example, if a Creative Commons license requires non-commercial use and you want to use the same material for commercial purposes, you can still go back to the copyright owner and ask for uh, a use of the material for a commercial purpose. So Creative Commons is one of the most common and well-known of the open content licensing schemes. Uh, you may have noticed that actually most of the images in today's presentation are reused under the terms of a Creative Commons license. Uh, and you can see that I've provided attribution details for each of the images in the strap on the right-hand side of the slide. Uh, statutory licences which are set out in the Copyright Act are another type of licensing source. These are a mechanism built into the Copyright Act and the copyright system designed to allow uh, particularly educational providers uh, and similar sorts of organisations access to material on uh, more useful and efficient terms than having to get permission from all of the copyright owners involved. Um, another type of licensing source could be voluntary collective licenses, which are administered by collecting societies. Um, so again, this is the idea of what's called a blanket license or a broad license um, provided by a single body to a range of copyright protected material. Uh, there are a number of collecting societies in Australia uh, focusing on different types of content and different types of use scenarios. Uh, the Copyright Agency, for example, licenses the reuse of words and images through their Rights Portal online licensing platform. Uh, music has uh, traditionally been administered by either APRA AMCOS or the PPCA, depending on whether the music was recorded or not. Uh, more recently, APRA AMCOS and the PPCA have launched bundled licensing options through a joint initiative called One Music Australia. Uh, which is designed to be able to provide licences that apply for uh, both the APRA AMCOS and the PPCA system for music that you might want to make use of. Um, so if you're looking for information about those, there is some 
uh, links here. So the rights portal you can find at rightsportal.creativecommons, uh, sorry, rightsportal.copyright.com.au. Um, or similarly, One Music Australia is available at onemusic.com.au. Now, when thinking about uh, copyright licensing, I find it's quite tricky for people to get their head around how the whole system works. People see it as being uh, you know, quite complicated, that the types of licensing structures are long legalese documents uh, with lots of conditional clauses, uh, you know, and it can be quite, uh, quite a daunting task to look at a copyright license. And that is true. Um, but one of the ways I try to help people get their head around how licensing works and how they might structure a licensing approach that's appropriate for what they want to do is what I refer to as the bow tie model. So this is a kind of a, a diagrammatic approach to thinking about copyright licensing that I've been throwing around for the last couple of years. Um, and basically the way that it works is you have who's involved, the parties that are involved in the arrangement on one side and the types of uses that you want to make of the material on the other side. And sitting between those is a rights management process of some kind. So on the who's involved side, you have direct parties. So this might be the party that you're going to to get a copyright license from. Um, you know, they might be uh, an artist that you're bringing in for a project and you're directly uh, interacting with that party. But similarly, a lot of copyright material may also have third party material in it. So, you know, uh, an artist you're working with may be creating a, a large collective artwork that pulls in elements of a range of different sources and each one of those additional sources could be a third party that you might need to get clearances from. One of the other things that's important to think about is the intended uses that you want to make because how people talk about the types of things they want to do, the intended uses, uh, often doesn't correlate with how the Copyright Act talks about the rights that relate to that. Um, so for example, if you're thinking about the types of uses that you want to make uh, and your uses say need to copy or reproduce the material, you need to know that that means that you need the right of reproduction. Similarly, if you're wanting to put the material online, you need to know and understand that material online uses the right of communication under the copyright system. So you can see there's a kind of a disjoint between the way that people ordinarily talk about the types of things that they want to do and the types of rights that are related to that. Uh, so you need to understand firstly what you want to do and then how that is communicated or, or talked about from a copyright point of view. Because once you know and understand those things, you can make sure that your internal rights management processes uh, match up to and align to those uses that you want to make. Um, so particularly in bigger organisations, you might have a set of policy and procedure related to copyright. If you're an individual artist or a small to medium organisation, maybe you don't have quite as sophisticated a rights management structure, but certainly you would have some kind of a licence in place that's designed to secure the rights you need to make the uses that you're wanting to do. And those licences go out to those direct parties to ensure that you've got the rights that you need from them, that the scope is appropriate for what you want to do and that any limitations you want to place on those uses are included in the licence. Uh, and similarly, you may be getting licences from third party material that's also involved in the project. Now, the reason that I think about and, and discuss licensing in this kind of bow tie approach is because if you don't know and understand the uses that you want to make, it's very difficult to make sure that the licenses that you are getting in actually match up with the downstream uses that you want to make. Um, so while a lot of people think about licensing as the start of the process of managing copyright, I encourage people to start from the other end and think about what they want to do in order to then make sure that how they're getting licenses in match up with what they want to do at the other end. The only other sort of thing I'll say on that is that in some situations, your licensing system might encourage uh, the direct parties that you're working with to secure licenses from the third parties rather than you securing licenses from the third parties directly. So 
I'll just talk a little bit more about the nature of exclusive and non-exclusive licenses, because these are probably terms that you've heard uh, in your own work uh, and, and your own experiences as creators. So an exclusive arrangement means that only the person granted the license can use the material, but only in the manner specified in the license. So for example, it's pretty common for a book publishing agreement to, uh, you know, for a publisher to take an exclusive license from the author or the writer of the novel uh, in order to print and publish that book. Um, so in that arrangement, in that exclusive situation, the writer is not able to license another publisher, for example, to publish the same book, uh, particularly during the period of the license that's already in play. Uh, so like the copyright owner in that situation, an exclusive licensee can take legal action for copyright infringement by third parties. Um, so in order to be valid, exclusive licenses must be in writing and signed by the copyright owner. Uh, but it's worth noting that email and other electronic communications will generally satisfy this requirement. Uh, so you don't necessarily have to go and get uh, long, complicated legal documents in order to uh, secure the permissions or to grant or request an exclusive license. Uh, email can be fine, but you just have to make sure that it, it's very clear that the, uh, that's the intended relationship. Now, if you think about exclusive licensing as uh, essentially granting uh, all the rights to another party for a specified period, non-exclusive is slightly different. So non-exclusive licenses are fairly common. Uh, we do see them quite a lot in the arts. Um, and this is a situation where you grant someone a non-exclusive license to do something with your copyright material, but you can continue to use the material uh, in the way that you've also already granted to the non-exclusive licensor. Uh, so this also means that you can grant licenses to the same material for the same uses to other parties. Um, so you can continue making use of the material in the same way and you can provide licenses to other people to do the same thing. I guess one of the things worth flagging in relation to exclusive licensing, of course, is that if you've granted an exclusive license, you can't make use of the same material in the same way, but that doesn't restrict you from making any other uses outside of the scope of the exclusive license. So for example, if you've given an exclusive license to a website to publish an article that you wrote, um, you know, for the duration of copyright, uh, you can't then put that same article on a different website somewhere else uh, because you've already granted that exclusive license. But in theory, for example, you might be able to uh, publish it in a physical journal or magazine, uh, which wouldn't necessarily contravene the exclusive uh, license. Of course, it's important to know and understand the terms within the license to make sure that any other use that you want to make of the material uh, isn't impacted by the licensing arrangement. Um, and of course, it's if you're unsure, it's always good to go back to the license and see what it says or go back to whoever you've granted the license to and just make sure that they're okay with what use you want to make. So, and yeah, Kevin, sorry to yes. interrupt your line. Not at all. Um, we've got a question that's relating to um, um, exclusive licensing from Amy. Mm -hmm. yep. um, Amy wants to know if you grant an exclusive license, can you get a license back on your own uses of the material? Okay. Um, so in that situation, you're talking about an exclusive license where you've granted it to another party. And if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're looking at how you might get those rights back from the party that you've licensed them to. Oh, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, so um, in a situation where you've granted an exclusive license to another party, um, they gain all of the rights that you have uh, granted to them through the license. And whether or not they want to give you back some of the rights, uh, whether that be all the rights in the licensing arrangement or just some specific uses, is actually up to them as the exclusive licensee. Uh, they, you know, they have a license and they have those rights now. And if the use you want to make would be an infringement of the license you've granted to them, it's up to them whether or not they would be happy for you to do that. Um, so in that situation, you would need to check with them about the type of use that you want to make and make sure that they're okay with you doing that. And generally speaking, I'd encourage you to get something from them in writing an email is probably fine, but something from them in writing that says that they 
uh, acknowledge the type of use that you want to make and that they aren't going, you know, that they see it as being fine. Um, just so you've got something that backs up that they've given you permission to make that use. But the important thing there is to determine whether or not the use you want to make is within the scope of the exclusive license you've already granted or whether or not it's outside of it. If it falls within the scope of the license, then it's up to the person you've granted the license to, to determine whether or not they're okay with that use. Um, so, you know, from a relationship management point of view, it's good to think about uh, maintaining good relationships with any party you've licensed with uh, and being able to have those conversations with them if an opportunity comes up where you want to use the same material, uh, but it probably falls within the scope of the license you've already issued to that third party. Uh, so I hope that uh, kind of answers the question for you. Um, so some of the common barriers that come up when getting a license, um, and there are quite a few of them. The ADA has commissioned some research into how creators, uh, they're the kinds of experiences creative ha creators have when securing copyright licenses. Now, um, one of the biggest ones that comes up is that there's often um, a lack of awareness of copyright and how someone goes about uh, getting a license. So that kind of lack of copyright literacy can be a significant barrier in uh, the art sector going about securing permissions for the types of things that they want to do. So that might be that they're just not sure about the process of getting a license or similarly, they're not sure what's covered by the copyright, what rights relate to it and what duration it's protected for. Uh, and so as a result, they're just not clear about what they should be doing in, in terms of securing a license. Uh, one of the other things that's often flagged is the time and effort involved in getting a copyright license from a copyright owner. Um, in particular, identifying who the current copyright owner is can be a, a tricky and time consuming task. Um, it, it's, it may be, but is not always the person who originally created the material. So there could be a couple of steps in finding out who is the current owner of the copyright. And similarly, then negotiating with that party uh, to secure a license for the type of use you want to make can be quite time consuming. You know, copyright licensing takes time. I guess that's the, the short of it. And so it's important when thinking about your projects that you leave time to request permission and get that permission back. Um, I, I certainly know from my experience, that a lot of arts projects tend to leave things like copyright licensing and permissions to the last minute. Um, and that's probably not advisable, especially where you have a hard deadline that you need to meet. Think about including permissions earlier in your project process so that you can give yourself enough time to get the permissions that you need. Um, sometimes the barriers come up from the copyright owner themselves. So there might be a situation where it's actually uh, difficult to identify who the copyright owner is. This situation where material becomes what's referred to as an orphaned work. Uh, but similarly, there are lots of situations where a copyright owner might simply be unwilling to grant a license. So they withhold permission as a result, or they may say, we're willing to give you a permission, but the fee that they're requesting makes that permission outside of the budget for your project. Now, because of the nature of copyright as a private right, there's actually very little you can do about a situation where a copyright owner says no um, or specifies a high fee. Um, that's their prerogative as the copyright owner. Generally though, um, a lot of artistic projects will uh, see that as the end of the line um, and have to look for a way to either substitute the material they wanted to use or um, to do something else uh, in order to fill the gap. And look, that may be the outcome that results, but often it's worth going back to a copyright owner and trying to find out what the concern is, why they're unwilling to give you a permission and see whether or not there's a way that you can narrow down the scope of the permission you're requesting uh, into a way that's more comfortable for the copyright owner that's involved. Um, so generally, you know, keep a good relationship with parties you might wanna get permissions from and talk to them about what you're doing and the limitations that you have uh, and see whether there are ways that you can craft the license that you're asking for so that it works for both sides of the equation. But as I said, ultimately it is the prerogative of the copyright owner uh, and it's up to them whether or not they want to grant you a license or not. Um, so some tips when thinking about negotiating licenses, as a general rule, opt for getting things in writing 
Uh, I certainly know from my experience that the Australian arts sector often relies on uh, oral arrangements uh, and that, you know, that, that's fine in a casual sense, but when you're wanting to be able to point to something and prove that a permission was granted, it's certainly good to get things in writing. That doesn't have to be long and complicated legal documents, as I've said, permission can be in an email and that's fine. Um, but, you know, it's important to get those permissions and particularly where you're working with maybe other artists or people who maybe don't have strong copyright literacy, it's important to do everything you can to make sure all the parties involved really understand what they're getting into. So spend some time talking to the other parties about what the license is you're asking from them and why you're asking for the things that you're asking for. Um, it's also a good idea to keep your licenses fairly flexible where you can. Um, again, that may become more difficult if a copyright, license, a copyright owner isn't willing to license. Um, but, you know, keep your licenses fairly flexible. Try to avoid specifying, you know, specific types of technology or something um, because, of course, technology changes fairly rapidly. Um, also, where possible, uh, try to avoid contracting out of any rights that you might have under the Copyright Act, such as exceptions. Um, and also, think about your bow tie, think about those downstream uses that you want to make and whether or not that might require you to have to grant rights to another party. So, this comes into play in situations, for example, where you want to be able to uh, put material on a platform like YouTube, for example, or Facebook. Uh, and the nature of the terms of use of those platforms means that you're granting certain rights under copyright to the platform, be that YouTube or Facebook or any other platform, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it might be. Um, the terms of use of that platform says that you're granting a license and you essentially assert that you have the permissions that you need to do that. Um, so in order to make those kinds of uses, you need to make sure that you've got the right of communication under any arrangement that you ha might have in place uh, with the parties that you're working with. So it's important to think about not just the permissions that you need directly, but whether or not you need to be able to provide licenses downstream. Another similar sort of situation might be where you're wanting to uh, enter a film into a film festival or something like that, for example. Those kinds of uh, Awards and situations often will have a licensing arrangement in place uh, and you may need to provide a license as part of uh, you know, entering into or uh, submitting something for consideration into an awards program. Um, there, there, there's lots of different situations and scenarios where uh, these kinds of downstream licensing come up. Um, so, I've intentionally left the session with quite a long period at the end so that we can take questions. I find this kind of information uh, you know, and education tends to work better uh, when it's kind of directed by and responding to questions. Um, so before we kind of go into a QA, and I'll just give you a couple of links where you can get some information about copyright. Um, in particular, uh, you know, as I said, I want to follow up with some links and information and where you might get some advice as well. Um, so the Copyright Council, which is funded by the Australia Council for the Arts, they have uh, a wide range of very detailed and very good fact sheets uh, on all kinds of topics related to copyright. Uh, so if you go to their website, copyright.org.au, and you go to the find and answer section, there is an extensive set of uh, fact sheets uh, looking at all kinds of different situations. There might be some in there that are particularly useful to you at this time, such as uh, live streaming uh, and also, uh, you know, get, getting a license or assignment. Um, so they have fact sheets on both live streaming and assignments, which are probably particularly relevant to this conversation. Um, one of the other things is that the Australian Copyright Council also runs a free online legal advice service for creators and arts and cultural organisations. Um, if you go to copyright org.au and click on their services section, you can find information about the legal advice service and how to uh, request some advice through that service. Um, Arts Law Centre of Australia also has a really good set of copyright resources on their info hub. Uh, it's a little bit broader, the kind of information they have, because it covers a range of other legal topics, but there is a section specifically focused on copyright and moral rights. Uh, which has a whole range of resources, which are also very useful and informative. Um, 
And like the Copyright Council, Arts Law also runs a legal advice service. So they have a free telephone legal advice service and they have a document review service, which are generally free for artists and is available to arts organisations where they're a subscriber of the Arts Law Centre. Um, so that's the end of the webinar content for today. As I said, I'm, I'm keen to open it up for some questions so we can uh, really dig into the topic further. Uh, before I do that, I'll just uh, leave this slide up here for a second so I can provide the additional attribution information for some of the content in the slide set. Um, and that's it. Thank you for joining us. I hope the session has given you a better understanding of copyright licensing. Um, that's my details there and we'll um, take some more questions. Great. Thank you, Elliot. And we've got a bunch coming in. So if you're okay, we'll just um, jump in and, and, go, and keep going. Uh, but um, um, for everyone uh, who's got a question, feel free to just pop those in the Q&A and we'll try and get to those as, as many as we can. Um, listen, one of the questions, I think this is a really great question for your um, bow tie um, um, model. Um, this comes from Catalina and um, they specifically want to understand how does licensing or copyright work for, for instance, a dancer who uses recorded music um, for choreography, specifically for, an, uh, let's say, streaming that online or using it um, for an educational video, etc. Could you maybe use that example to maybe just sort of unpack a few things? Yeah, definitely. Look, um, it's it's always complicated because these kinds of situations are so uh, situational. They're so specific to um, not just the artist or uh, the particular choreography that you're talking about, but also, you know, the type of platform you might want to release it on and all of that. But it's important to understand that um, there are a couple of things that come into play for uh, dance and choreography. So, for example, Often when you're talking about um, choreographed work that's being recorded on, in video, for example, um, the dancer owns the dramatic work, the choreography, but whoever hit record on the video or the live streaming system technically owns the film of that performance. Uh, so that's important because depending on the relationship that you have with whoever's helping you, you know, record it or, or live stream it, um, you may need to think about how you ensure you've secured permissions from that third party in order to then be able to use the video for something else. So if you're wanting to record your dance work and put it on Facebook, for example, as a video, um, you need to think about and make sure that you've got a permission from the recordist to be able to do that. Um, because while they own the, the film, they, their rights are dependent on your rights in the choreography, but vice versa. Your use of the film is dependent on their rights as the filmmaker. So you might want to have some kind of a, a simple mechanism in place that says that they assign or license to you the use of the film uh, for a wide range of purposes. Beyond that, um, incorporating other material into your choreographic work such as recorded music is when you start to move into um, a range of other types of licensing arrangements that you might need in place. Um, so one option may be to secure permission from the musical act themselves um, but that will become tricky for example where the musical act is an APRA AMCOS member. So where they're not an APRA AMCOS member, they're likely to still retain the rights that they need in order to give you a license to put that material online. Uh, whereas if they're an APRA AMCOS member, then as part of the nature of their membership agreement, they grant certain rights to APRA AMCOS. Uh, and then APRA AMCOS becomes the party that needs to give you those permissions. Uh, and similarly, if it's recorded music, uh, whether that be a recording of a live performance or, or a studio recording, um, there's also a potential that a PPCA arrangement may need, be, may need to be put in place as well. So APRA AMCOS controls the performing rights in the music and PPCA often re, um, controls the sound recording of the music. Uh, so it, as I said, it's very circumstantial. It depends specifically on the, the 
arrangement that you've got in place. And if you've got a particularly complicated uh, arrangement, it's probably not a bad idea to think about going to the advice service from the Australian Copyright Council or Arts Law. Uh, but as a general rule, those kinds of arrangements uh, may see a number of different players needing to be part of your bow tie model, part of how you get those permissions in order to make those downstream uses. Great. So I hope that answers the question. I, that, I think that was a great sort of overview. And there's maybe a few questions that's come through that might um, might cover that. So <laughs> we'll go to a, a slightly different question. Um, and this question is from, uh, um, sorry, let me just double check that if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I, I can't grab their name, apologies, but- um, that's okay from one of our audience members wanting to know, do you know of any way maybe using technology to emboss or stamp a digital visual artwork, maybe not so much to prevent copying, but to give um, a, um, um, clients a perception um, of this prevention? So is there some sort of... Mm, okay. Yeah, look, the, the whole question around things like uh, the use of metadata, uh, electronic rights information and uh, digital rights management is a tricky one. It has a, uh, an interesting and quite complicated history in terms of uh, the relationship between copyright material, the internet and technology. Um, that said, most platforms that you might use for creating work often have a way of embedding copyright information in the file. So for example, Microsoft Word in the properties for a document gives you the ability to identify key information related to the copyright, such as the author of the document, the year it was created, that kind of information. Similarly, platforms uh, or, or software applications like Photoshop or InDesign have ways of including that kind of metadata information about the rights into the material that you're putting out. Um, Photoshop, for example, can, uh, as part of the export options, when you're choosing to export as a JPEG or a PNG or something, for example, has a copyright section where you can then add in information about the work. You know, what's the title of the work, who created the work, what year was it created, that kind of thing. Of course, um, and that's not a bad thing to do. It can be quite useful in terms of uh, making sure that information is part of your files before you put them on the internet. That said, of course, uh, the internet's a little bit of the kind of digital wild west and whether or not that information is kept as part of the file by other users downstream is harder to say. Um, but at least as a, a starting point, you can include that kind of rights information in a number of different types of digital files. Um, using different platforms uh, such as, you know, the Adobe PDF system, uh, Creative Cloud and things like Microsoft Word. Okay, great. Um, another question, um, uh, this is from Leanne. Um, uh, do you need a signature from every person in a picture if you want to use it? For instance, if you take a picture in a gallery and there are, you know, visitors in the shot? Okay, um, so this is a question that relates to uh, clearances for the people in the photo, the subject matter of a photograph. Now, this is an interesting one because uh, certainly my understanding under Australian law is that you don't have a right to your personal image, uh, unlike countries like the US where there is a personal image right. Um, we don't have a similar right in the Australian jurisdiction. And so actually the process of getting model clearances is an industry practice. It's not a legal requirement. Um, that said, I'm not saying that you should not do it, um, but rather that it's not actually prescribed by law, um, except in some limited circumstances, um, you know, particularly related to the consumer law and somebody with a reputation capable of kind of imparting uh, an endorsement on something. So in most ordinary circumstances, normal people in a, a setting like a gallery probably don't have much recourse in relation to the kind of photographing of them in situ. Uh, that said, it's always important to consider other types of considerations, non-legal considerations. So things like, um, you know, ethics, particularly when you're talking about people who, you know, children and young people or, 
um, people who maybe have a diminished um, cognitive capacity. There are genuine ethical concerns that you should think about when photographing those kinds of situations. Um, but also generally just come from a relationship management point of view, um, model clearances can be a useful thing to do uh, for kind of keeping everybody happy and okay with what you want to do with the material, but they're not actually required under the copyright system. Okay. And of course, the Australia Council has got some specific protocols for working with um, children and young people, which you can access via our website as well. Mm maybe find that resources and resources and share it as well. Okay, um, listen, I'm just sort of looking at the time. There's maybe time for a couple more. There's so many questions that's come through so, <laughs> and, and some of them are quite complex and, and, and detailed. So I think as per Elliot's advice is to, is to maybe go and um, look through some of those websites and to contact that, those services to, to get mm. that um, um, answers as well. But um, uh, if we, um, so this is a question, um, um, from Indigo Ellie, uh, when using found materials, for, for example, maps or street directories, um, which um, generally have their own copyright, um, as found materials in projects or artworks, is permission needed or re recommended in all cases? So I presume this is sort of for uh, art making using, um, you know, everyday items and so on. Yeah. Okay, so in relation to found objects, um, again, it's always situational. It will depend on the specific circumstances that you're dealing with. Um, but for example, my default assumption wouldn't be that a street directory uh, you know, doesn't have a copyright owner. It's going to be pretty obvious that there's a publisher of that street directory and that they are likely to either be the licensee or the owner of the maps included in the directory. And depending on the age of the material, it's if they're fairly contemporary maps, then there's a good chance that they are still protected by copyright. And, uh, you know, you might want to consider whether or not you need a license for that material. Uh, that said, if you are kind of working in that space, it's also worth looking up. Um, there are some specific provisions in the Copyright Act in relation to collage, um, which are worth having a look at. Um, but in terms of kind of just reproducing significant portions of a map, um, it's likely that that could be still protected by copyright. And then it's up to you to think about whether or not from a risk management point of view, uh, that's likely to be a problem. Uh, but definitely there's a good chance it will be protected by copyright and it's probably not a bad idea to secure a permission if you can. Um, bodies like map organisations may have a standardised licensing uh, request system on their website, for example, where you specify the particular map that you're wanting and the type of use that you want to make. Um, or similarly, you might contact the company and request a license for the material that you're using. Great. Well, I think that that is all the time we have for questions. Um, Elliot, um, thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, and we will um, wrap up in, in a second. But um, are there maybe any sort of, you know, what, what, any sort of final thoughts you want to leave us before we, before we say goodbye? Look, I guess as a kind of closing comment, I would say um, it's important to understand that copyright is complicated. Like it is, it is a, I can't remember exactly how many, but it's about 700 pages in the Copyright Act. There's a lot in it. It's a complicated space. Um, it's important for artists to know and think about copyright in their work, both in relation to the management and protection of their own material, but also in relation to the use of third party material that they might want to include in their work. So look, it may not be the most interesting or sexy topic, but it's definitely an area that artists could stand to learn a lot more about um, and find ways to educate themselves about the copyright system in Australia. It is there for artists. It is designed as a protection mechanism for artists. And so knowing something about it is useful to any artist. Um, the only other kind of caveat I'll say there is when you're looking for copyright information online, um, make sure that you're reading copyright information about the Australian legal system. So I often find artists will come to me saying things like, oh, but can't I use that under fair use? 
Uh, fair use is a, a legal doctrine in the US copyright system and is not part of the Australian copyright system. And so making sure that you're looking at information that relates to the Australian system when you are educating yourself is important. Mm -hmm. I do strongly recommend the Copyright Council's uh, amazing set of resources and arts laws resources, um, but there are a number of other places you might go for information. The um, What used to be the Department of Communications and the Arts now what is it, regional and investment, et cetera. Uh, sorry, it, regional and infrastructure, et cetera, uh, have a range of information uh, on their website as well. So if you go to communications.gov.au, there's quite a lot of information resources related to copyright, um, in particular things like the duration of copyright. Great. Thank you again, um, Elliot. Uh, listen, uh, everyone, before we go, a reminder that next week we've got a couple more um, webinars coming. On Wednesday, we are joined by Patrick Moriarty covering arts governance and the role of the board as we reimagine and plan for a COVID, post-COVID world. So make sure you send the invite to your directors um, or chair. Um, they are, of course, welcome to join. Um, then on Friday, um, we will be hosting our first session that's suggested by you. Our first sector-led webinar will be hosted by Monica Stevens. Um, she will be exploring practical and actionable marketing tools for artists and organisations. Um, so that's all for today. And I want to say a big thank you to everyone for joining us uh, and sharing your thoughts and experiences with each other. Um, thank you, Elliot, um, for an insightful and useful session. And we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Goodbye. <laughs>